I'll be reading Psalm 150. It can be found on page 583 of your pew Bibles. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our gospel reading this morning, the gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. You can follow along on page 115 in the New Testament portion of your pew Bibles. Listen now for God's word for you. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then... The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to share with you a proud moment in my ministry, a moment when I was resourceful and creative and compassionate. And this happened the very first summer that I was associate pastor at the First Presbyterian Church in Lee Summit, Missouri. I took 16 youth and four adults to a conference at the YMCA of the Rockies in Estes Park, Colorado. And one afternoon, we had free time, so we all went on a hike up to Emerald Lake in the Rocky Mountain National Park. I think some of you have probably been there before. And when you have 16 teenagers and four adults, and you're all hiking together on a narrow mountain trail, you start to spread out a little bit like this. And we were getting kind of close to the top, and I was kind of the the lead adult, which doesn't always happen, but in this case I was. And one of the athletic youth who was also kind of far up ahead fell or tripped or stumbled or something, and he cut his knee. Well, shoot, I was not the adult that had the first aid kit in her backpack. And I looked at the young man's knee, and 
you know, it, it wasn't too bad. It was, it was more, more of a scrape than a cut, but it was bleeding, and it needed to be covered. So I looked in my backpack, and I didn't have any Band-Aids, and I didn't have any gauze, but I had something that was dry and absorbent with me. So I took it out, and it was one of those items that you might purchase in the feminine needs aisle at the grocery store, but it was individually wrapped, so we knew it was sterile. So I unwrapped it and unfolded it, placed it on the young man's knee. It was the perfect shape and size to cover a knee, but I didn't have any tape with me, no medical tape in there. I did, in my backpack, have a bright, beautiful, pink bandana. So I used that to tie this item around the young man's knee, and voila, he was good to go. You're welcome, I said to him. And after seeing me do that, in the six and a half years that I was associate pastor working with the youth of that church, not one youth ever came to me with a scraped knee ever again. They did occasionally let me in on helping them with other kinds of wounds, though. Wounds of stress, rejection, loneliness, grief. Tending wounds is a big part of ministry for all of us, all of us who are uh, ministers together as members of a church. And thank goodness, because there's a lot of hurt out there. By the way, if you're wondering what wound I treated the most, number one by far was the fear of disappointing their parents, a problem I think has only gotten worse over the years. Well, speaking of wounds, did you notice the sequence of events in the gospel reading? Did you pick up on that? That the disciples are in a locked room. When Jesus appears to them on Easter night, he stands there and says, peace be with you. Then, then he shows them his hands into which someone had driven nails just three days earlier and his side, which a soldier had pierced with a spear to make sure he was really dead. Then, and only then, did the disciples rejoice when they saw the Lord. Now, in the passage leading up to this one, Mary Magdalene had not recognized Jesus either, but she did when she heard him say her name. But the disciples, they needed to see his wounds. Now, let's recall together the wounds of Christ. Before sentencing him to die, Pilate first had Jesus flogged. And he did this thinking this ought to be enough. This was one of the most feared punishments a person could receive in those times. I read a description of a typical whip that might have been used. It had three leather tails to it, and each tail would have a little metal ball or a sheep's bone attached to the end to inflict maximum damage on the person receiving this punishment. Jesus would have been a mess, a mess, after being flogged. The skin of his back would have been ripped open in multiple places. He would be dehydrated and weak from loss of blood and probably some vomiting. Crucifixion meant nails pounded into Jesus' hands and feet, meant he slowly suffocated over a period of hours while still bearing all those wounds on his back, his hands, and his feet. I'm thinking at this point the crown of thorns was probably the least of his issues. And in addition to all that, Jesus was stripped naked. Now, most artistic renderings of Jesus on the cross respectfully add a loincloth because while we can sort of a little bit handle 
looking at Jesus being crucified, we cannot handle looking at a Jesus who is being crucified and is also naked. It is too much. And yet, that only serves to highlight how humiliating crucifixion was. Which is the whole point. It was the most shameful death a person could have. The whole point was to slowly and publicly torture the person to death with their most private parts of themselves hanging on display in order to send a message. So Jesus was not only physically tortured, he was psychologically traumatized as well. After his resurrection, Jesus was fully alive and so transformed that he could enter a locked room. And yet, he still had his wounds. The disciples saw Jesus was calm so he could see and touch Jesus' wounds because the wounds were part of Jesus' identity now. Christ would not be Christ without those wounds. We would not be who we are either without our wounds. The resurrection teaches us that God doesn't erase or eliminate our wounds, but heals and transforms them. The hope and the promise of the resurrection is that God takes every wound, even the ones we have inflicted on ourselves, on the ones we love, and God transforms them. Now that doesn't mean we need to seek out things that hurt us, it does not justify hurting others, doesn't mean we get to use our wounds as an excuse or as a currency to get our way. But as Julian of Norwich once said, before God Our wounds are our glory. As Richard Rohr puts it, the risen Christ is the pledge and guarantee of what God will do with all our crucifixions. It is no longer an absurd or tragic universe. Our hurts now become the home for our greatest hopes. Now, I don't know if I've shared my sermon writing method with you before, but it it goes something like this. I study and scribble real hard for a while, and then uh, I get up and clean something, because this clears my brain without distracting me from what I'm thinking about. So yesterday, you know, scribble, 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 and then I got up and emptied the medicine cabinet in the bathroom so I could Windex the glass shelves and get everything nice and sparkly. And I took down the toothbrush holder, which is made out of some kind of hammered metal, and I turned over the toothbrush holder to clean it, and I saw this label on the bottom. Designed by skilled artisans for a more pleasant home. The natural beauty of this item is enhanced by irregularities introduced by the unique handcrafted process. Well, that's kind of a lot for a toothbrush holder, in my opinion. But it got me thinking, and it reminded me of similar labels that often come with leather handbags or furniture. Maybe you've seen these. Um, Something along the lines that the imperfections are signs of the genuineness of the leather, and it's those imperfections that make the item beautiful and unique. And of course, there is a huge difference between losing a limb or an eye on the battlefield and the imperfections in a leather handbag, but, but you get where I'm going with this. God makes all things new and heals all our wounds and diseases. But the beauty that emerges from those wounds stays forever. So I'd like to invite you to reflect for a moment 
on your wounds. Maybe they're keeping you awake at night and you need some care. And if that's you, Pat or I would love to visit with you and walk with you personally or help connect you with a Stephen minister. Perhaps you already have a resurrection story to tell about a wound, about the terrible thing that happened that made no sense and wasn't fair and shredded your soul. And now you can look back and see how you would not be the person you are today without that wound. Whatever wounds you bear today, whatever they are, however you got them, I invite you to picture them in your mind's eye and to visualize the light and love of God pouring into them because that is what is happening all the time, all the time. And remember that when about people about creation, and remember that when about people about creation, as Psalm 50, that marvelous psalm which the choir just sang so beautifully, says, "Let praise and self form the whales to keep watch, stumble of pounds, the elderly dogs and cats nobody wants for you." is alive. He is risen and we are all included. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.